Hi, everybody. It's Matt from Discover College Soccer. I hope you're enjoying the podcast, whether that's on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. I also wanted to let you know about the Discover College Soccer Study Table. This is our brand new online portal that is complete with a 14-part online course giving you all of the ins and outs of the college soccer recruiting process. There's also a wealth of resources such as checklists, templates, there's the spreadsheets that have every soccer program in the country along with their coaches, their contact information, their social media information, uh, some basic stats about the school and more. Plus there's an online community where you can ask your questions, share your wins, your losses, any questions that you may have around the college soccer recruiting process. It's all there at the Discover College Soccer study table that you can find at discovercollegesoccer.com slash study table and hopefully we will see you there. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Discover College Soccer. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Coach Nathan from Southeastern Louisiana. Welcome, Coach. How you doing? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, excited to talk to you about your program and uh, and see how things are going. You know, we're, we're talking here. It's June 12th when we're talking. I know this will air later, but uh, just to give people an idea. Um, so we're close to that June 15th uh date so in terms of your recruiting calendar you know how how heavy will you be talking to the the juniors of the 25 class on that date versus how much of your 24 class is wrapped up kind of what's your recruiting calendar look like yeah so we um we're pretty much you know we're, we're at a, a level and a size where you know we'll start initiating conversations on june 15th with with those 2025s but a lot of our recruiting you know typically is done on that calendar year um, so, you know, we're still he heavily looking at 24s, hoping that we can get, you know, the, the aim is to have kind of three quarters of that class done by signing day in November. And then, you know, you've still got wiggle room for that. You know, you never know what's going to pop up late in that spring and gives you room then to, to still bring more people into that class in the spring. So, you know, over this kind of past year, um, this is my first year as the head coach here. And so my assistant and myself, you know, we've kind of, been looking heavily at 2024s and then you know we identified 25s that we we're able to now get in contact with on, on June 15th but you know a large bulk of our recruiting and offers that are out there are for, for 2024 for sure okay well you mentioned you're you're you've had one season under your belt right uh over there and uh, I'm sure it's it's going strong on the recruiting trying to get the players that fit your system and do what you want so what how big a roster do you aim for what's your kind of ideal size in in a overall roster um it would probably somewhere around that 30 mark and um, not not too not too much below it and, and not massively over it and i think um somewhere around there it, it drives a good level of competition in the group to where complacency can't kick in you know people don't become comfortable but also not to the point where mentally they're they're just stressed out and feel too much pressure, right? And so we've got to have that good, that balance in the squad size to where every day at practice, everybody's bringing it and they're, they're looking to compete for their spot, their playing time and, and, and so on. Okay. Well, when you're out recruiting and, and looking at players, what are some of the main events that you like to go to that are kind of must-see TV on, on your list? Yeah, so, um, you know, with, with, with budgets and making budgets work, you know, typically we're going to be at the ECNL events, the, the GA showcases. Um, you know, we have the, the USYS with Southern Regionals. That's going to be happening down the road in a couple of weeks in Baton Rouge. Um, and then we're out at, at ID camps. You know, we go to Mississippi and work a lot of the junior college ID camps there. Um, some of the other schools invite us to work their ID camps. We host ID camps ourselves. And so... Um, but for the most part, it's going to be those larger events, ECNL and GA, um, just as well with, with where we're, we're located. You know, we're kind of five hours from Houston, so it's pretty difficult to just get there for a game on one weekend. And so, you know, we, we'll typically go to the events and then as conversations progress with recruits and, you know, things start moving down the line, then we'll definitely be going out to like individual and single games on, on weekends for sure. That makes sense. Well, when you're at an event or an ID camp or any of these things, how much of it is you going to see players who've reached out to you uh, versus you just happening upon players at a game or, or discovering somebody brand new? Um, 
I'd say it's probably a 30-70 split. So, you know, 30% of it is, is the people that have, have reached out to us. And, you know, again, going off of what I previously said, how we do a lot of recruiting on that year, you know, we, we do get multiple emails, but a lot of them usually are kind of like this year, you know, we'd get emails from 26s that you know, we, we can't even, we, we're not even going to go out and really look at them. We'll keep an, we'll keep an eye on them as, as the kind of months progress and that and definitely kind of invite them to camp. But um, for the most part, you know, we get, we'll get out, we'll try and watch everybody that's of a recruitable age that, that contacts us. And, you know, we like to give them the respect of doing that. If they, if they, you know, put the time in to look into our school and contact us, we're never going to not go and watch somebody. You know, we'll get out, we'll get to their game, we'll watch them. And then obviously then the, the larger part of it as well is just, you know, being at the fields and seeing who's who's on the game and, and who we like from there. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. So in terms of your overall roster makeup, I looked I looked online. It looks like you got a, a handful of junior college kids as well as a handful of international kids. So, so how does recruiting internationally and transfers uh, work into your overall recruiting mix? So, you know, we, we don't want to pretty much leave any stone unturned, right? You know, we, we're going to look in every nook and cranny to try and find the players that we think can come in and be great fits for our program. Firstly, as people, but then, you know, obviously then as soccer players after and, and student athletes. And so um, we, we try to, you know, look everywhere, look at all corners of the globe. Um, one thing that kind of, has that I have kind of noticed over over the last kind of five years is that a lot of internationals that come in as freshmen will struggle for for a year or so, you know, getting acclimatized to the, the US soccer style of soccer and college soccer in specific. Um, and so that's where, you know, typically then the JUCO route is a bit better because they've had a couple of years playing in, in the US under their belt and got more familiar with the, with the college style of game and then we can bring them in that way. Okay. Well, in terms of just the school itself um you know as a parent i'm gonna always wonder okay what's this gonna cost me um so i know i'm not holding you to hard numbers here but if, if there was a recruit that was interested and in, in looking saying okay can can i make this work um can you just give me a, a rough estimate of of what an in, incoming player could expect in terms of just how much is school? What what possible scholarships are there, both academic and athletic? Can you stack? What's just a, a general picture might might look like? Yeah, so um, you know we do we do allow students to stack scholarships. So you know you've got the opportunity to get some great academic aid based off of ACT scores and, and, and GPAs. Um, you know we do still require the ACT to get academic aid. That's not handed out yet, just based off of GPA. I think you know down the line we may move to that model. Um, obviously athletic aid, we're we're fully funded athletically, so you know we've got the opportunity to hand out athletic aid there. And then you know also if you if you're qualifying for any government aid or even if there's private scholarships, right? So your church might have a scholarship for you. You know we'll we'll allow you to stack that onto it and and build a, a really great package overall. Um, we have a real good way that we can we can help people from out of state with, with the out of state fees as well. So you know we're able to give a lot of help towards that and kind of everybody on the team is is you know roughly paying in state tuition, um, which is great and you know that, that's where it helps us when you see our roster with how far people are coming from all over the country and even overseas. Um, I think it's roughly about thirty thousand for the year for a regular out of state student, say eighteen thousand I think for in state. Um, and you know when when we're able to to build scholarship packages, I think we're you know, we're able to get the price down there to where it's a real competitive uh, you know value that you you could be paying, and, and also you know that you feel is is worth what you're going to be getting back, right? The the whole D one experience, the the college, the educational side of things, you know the campus, the facilities that the campus has available, um, and all all of the perks of just being a regular student on top of being that that athlete as well. Okay. Well, if you've got a recruit, it looks like the financial part's going to work out. The You've seen them play. They've looked at your school. Everything looks good. What is it that's going to make, you know, what what is that hierarchy of things that's going to make you want to offer a spot uh, to a player? Um, so, obviously, you know, we'll go out, we'll, we'll ID the players, and then, you know, then we'll start communications. Communications are going well. You know, they're ready for an offer. We're at a point where we're ready to offer because we've seen enough. Um but then we sit down, you know, we'd set up a Zoom call or a phone call and, 
you know, if mum and dad want to get on board, we're more than happy for that as well. And then we'll kind of put that offer out there. We'll get a, a hard copy of it sent over electronically. Um, and then, you know, we don't ever put any pressure on anybody to commit, right? So we're never going to hand out an offer and be like, hey, we need an answer by this time next week, right? But a big thing for us is that when we're recruiting somebody, they go and take their time. They go and look at other schools. They go and look at other programs because the worst thing that can happen for a coach is that you bring a player in, they've not done any research anywhere else. And then for one reason or another, it might not work out on, on our side or their side. And, and that's the last situation that any coach in the country wants, right? And so we're very big on, on telling recruits that, hey, go and look at other schools, have something to compare, because when you make the decision to come to Southeastern, you know, we want to know and we want you to know that it's the right decision for you and you feel that Southeastern is the place for you. Oh, that's great. Well, let's talk a little bit about the school. Some folks may not be familiar with Southeastern. Um, you've been there a year now. Uh, so what, what have you found to be some of the great things about the school uh, that, you know, maybe some cool facts that maybe we're not going to know just by going through the website? Yeah, well, so I've actually been here for four years. I was an assistant before oh. I became the head coach. So, okay, my, uh, my bad, my bad. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> that's all good. Um, the town itself, Hammond, is, is a real great, you know, small community feel town, a typical kind of traditional college town where the, the population increases drastically when school's in and then decreases when school's out. Um, but the community, and I always tell recruits that the community and the school, they kind of go hand in hand. And I don't think one would exist without the other. You know, the people of the community cannot get behind the school enough. They can't give enough of their time. Um, they want to help out as much as possible. You know, the, the mayor of the town, his house is right behind home plate in the baseball stadium. And so, you know, that kind of gives you the idea of how much the community is, is bought in and invested into the school. Um, it's situated in, in a great part of town. You know, it's walking distance from the downtown area where there's lots of locally owned, you know, restaurants, cafes, little boutique shops. Um, and again, you know, it's all kind of like mama papa businesses. And then as you get to the outskirts of town, that's where you're going to see kind of the bright light businesses and, and your know, chains and, and all of that stuff. Um, the school, you know, a lot of people when we're bringing them in for, for visits and especially those that are coming from out of state, you know, we always ask them on the phone, What's your, what, what do you think of Louisiana? And typically, you know, they're coming back with swamps, alligators, heart humid. That part's definitely right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they get, they step foot on campus on their tour and, you know, nine times out of 10, they're like, wow, this isn't what we was expecting. You know, there's so much greenery about. It's, it's a real beautiful campus. I mean, there's plenty of, like I said, the greenery provides plenty of outdoor seating to where you, if you wanted to sit outside and do any homework or, you know, studies. The weather's decent all year round, so you've got plenty of opportunity to do that. Um, the, you know, the union, there's a lot of kind of renovation and improvements going on in campus, and, and that's always good for recruits to see because it shows that, money's being put into the school and investments being there to help keep the school relevant and, and upgraded. Um, and then obviously, you know, touching back on how the community is so involved, right? I think our CAF has won regional awards for their food. There's people in the local community that will buy meal plans for the cafeteria. So it won't be strange to see people from the community in there having lunch or breakfast. Same with the recreation center. You know, there's people from the community that will buy gym memberships and you can be in the, in the student wellness center and there'll be just people from the community working out in there. Um, and then, you know, we have the, where there's like a sidewalk that goes all the way around campus. And as the weather improves, as the year goes on, more and more families are going to be out there walking, riding their bikes, going for runs, people walking their dogs. And, you know, the people, people just can't do enough to be friendly for you and say hello. And then, you know, all the, all the people that own the local restaurants and the local businesses, um, you know, you know, there's plenty of support for, for the athletics and, you know, there's, there's, you know, opportunities and, and deals on different days of the weeks for the student body to go and feast out in different restaurants or, or cafes and, and you know just really have a good time no oh, it sounds great well <clears throat> besides the soccer part of it there's obviously the academic part of it so how do your student athletes really balance their their school studies and and the sports side of it and what kind of support systems does a school offer to help them manage both of those so this, this is a, a really good part, right? Because we, we're, you know, heavily involved in, in academics. We want the girls to see the importance of it, right? Because when we're recruiting people, we say that if you're lucky, soccer will last four years. If you're unlucky, maybe five, right? After that, you're then going into the world of work. 
and we want to make sure you're best prepared for when you step into that world of work and everything that you've learned in the classroom you're confident in yourself and you believe that you've got the job because you deserve it and you're ready for it um you know so a real cool thing about our school is that we don't have classes on a friday so first of all straight off the bat we play our conference games friday and sunday so we're pretty much never missing class um now our, our classes are small in size. I think it's an average of about 21 to a professor. So, you know, you're always in class. You're in a small class. The professors know who you are. They're going to know you're on the soccer team. They'll know when your games are. And all of that stuff comes into helping you be successful, right? The more personal you can be with professors and the, the more of these intimate relationships we can have, you know, then the more, you know, the more success you're going to find in the classroom. Then outside of that, we have the uh, Sharp Centre in the, in the stadium and um, basically our soccer team, that's for student athletes, will be in there twice a week. We'll do our study hall hours in there. Um, if they want to go in there in any other times in the day, they have open hours. There's free tutoring available for the student athletes. Um, you know, the director of that facility and, and the other people that work in there are more than happy to check over any work if you want. Um, and, and again, that's another tool that helps them stay on top of their studies. We then have the director of that facility. He His name is Austin and he works with our team. So, you know, he makes sure our team when it comes to scheduling classes, being on track to graduate on time, being in the right amount of hours to be eligible. You know, he helps take a lot of pressure off of, off of their shoulders on that side of things as well. And again, it's just, there's, there's so much in place. There's no reason that people can't be successful in the classroom. And I think, um, you know, over this past year, in the fall, we had the highest team GPA in the athletic department. And then this past semester, I think we were like second or third in the department. So, you know, we, we do put an emphasis on it. And then when we're on the road, you know, there's plenty of downtime in the hotels where the girls can get their laptops out, their books out, and make sure they're just staying on track with all their studies. Well, that's fantastic. Well, you talked about not having class on Fridays, but if, if we were in season, you know, fast forward to the fall, what, what would a normal week look like for the players in terms of, you know, classes, meals, training times, all that kind of thing? Yeah, so we practice in the morning. So we're typically out on the field at 6 a.m. Um, and then practices is, you know, in full flow by 6.30. Um, people typically end starting classes until about 9.30. Um, we kind of keep that 8 a.m. block free so, so we can practice. Um, there's some degrees where there might be like one class in one semester that they have to take at 8 a.m. And so, you know, we work around that. And rather than just have them miss practice, we'll kind of just move move the practice time maybe a little bit earlier so everybody can still be involved. Um, so, yeah, and then a typical week. So if we start with a Friday game. We play Friday night. Saturday is then going to be kind of a, a recovery session on the field, just going over some kind of tactical stuff for our opposition on Sunday. Uh, and then Sunday we play at midday again. Uh, Monday is typically our day off, so the girls can, you know, just kind of decompress, reset, refocus for the new week, the new task ahead. If anybody's wanting to go and do any extra work, you know, we always have our uh, equipment out available for the girls, and so they're more than welcome to get out in the field or in the weight room. Uh, Tuesday is then kind of a, a regen session. So, hey, welcome back, new week, nothing crazy, nothing massive, because you know we've had a busy weekend and, and a day off. Um, usually ends with a bit of fun in a 5 and 5 tournament, which, you know, gets very competitive out there. All the girls want their picture with their team on, on Instagram for the week as 5 and 5 champions. Um, Wednesday is then moving into, on then Tuesday after practice, we, we lift. So we lift once a week in the fall. Um, and that's kind of more of a, an injury prevention lift and just making sure that we're, we're minimising risks of injuries there. Wednesday, we then move into our big session. So, you know, a, a bigger load. Um, more areas, you know, more kind of tactical attack against defence and then a bit of conditioning at the end of it. Thursday is then real low again. And then we're looking at pre-game set pieces and, you know, a little bit of fun as a team before before the session starts. And, and we try and have that fun element in there, you know, most days with kind of some fun type of game before, before we get moving into the main bulk of the session. And it, especially with practising at that time in the morning, it, it helps to kind of energise the squad and, get the zombies out of everybody and, and you know, get them alert and, and ready for the session. No, I love it. All right. Well, let, well, let's talk a little bit more about, about the soccer side of things there. Right. So you mentioned earlier um, your roster size, but what about your staff size? How, how many people do you have both on direct soccer staff, as well as maybe support staff in the department? What role does everybody play there? Yeah. So we have um, myself and then my assistant, uh, Jack, his full-time assistant and then we're just bringing in a graduate assistant this year as well that we be starting in August 
um, and he'll be working with the goalkeepers and, and help coach the goalkeepers. Um, and then outside of that, we have a full-time athletic trainer that's with us for everything, you know, practices, home games, away games. Really great at his job. Um, does a real great job when it comes to kind of the GPS data and the analytics. And, you know, we all work together to help, you know, make sure that we're monitoring the load of everybody. Um, a full-time strength coach that, that works with our team. And so, you know, all of our lifts, he, he takes care of all of that. Um, and then outside of that, you know, there's a, a nutritionist that, that we have that's, that's available and she'll come in and, and give regular talks with the team. And, you know, if any of the girls want to set up appointments with her, she's the type of person that will go to the grocery store with them and show them what like a good shop for an athlete looks like and, you know, type good meals that athletes can eat. Um, we have the, the academic advisors. So, you know, there's, we've got probably, what, three four kind of immediate staff on, on, on the team. And then there's kind of two, three external staff to, to be added on there. Okay. That's great. Well, now you mentioned uh, GPS and low data. So what, what sort of technology do you guys implement on a regular basis, whether for training or matches and, and, and how does that look? Yep. So we have the, the Titan GPS trackers. So the girls will wear them every day at practicing and games. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just monitoring basically their, their physical exertion and high speed running, their sprint speeds, how many kind of stops and starts they're doing, their total distance is covered. Um, with goalkeepers, we're looking at kind of the inertia and the, how much force they're producing, producing and hitting the ground at. Um, just so we can kind of manage our training load throughout the week to, you know, help reduce the risk of injury, right? You know, it's no good to anybody if you've got four or five kids on the sideline for a large bulk of the season. You know, nobody's going to help you win games there, right? So the healthier we can keep everybody, the better chance we have in, in competing on the field. And I think that, you know, we do a real great job with everybody on staff that, that has an impact on it. You know, I think our number last year was in the fall was about 96% practice participation. So, you know, we rarely had people out injured. Um, you know, the, one of the girls came in as a freshman who was already carrying an injury and was out for the year. And that's kind of one of the main reasons why our participation was even not even higher. And so we do a real good job in managing that. And then camera wise, you know, we use the Spideo camera, which helps kind of automatically track and follow. But it's brilliant for us when we're editing and clipping film to show the girls because, you know, you can drag and, and scroll through the camera. And, and if we had two different drills going on in practice. We could watch one side of the field and then we could flip over and watch the other side of the field. So, we, yeah, we use uh, the Spideo camera for film and then Titan for the, the GPS tracking. Okay, that's great. Well, going to on-the-field game stuff, how would you describe your style of coaching and the style of play that you guys want to implement? So the, the biggest thing for us is making sure that the girls – kind of don't have a fear when they're on the field, right? You know, it's, it's very important that they all understand that mistakes are inevitable. Everybody makes mistakes, especially in a game of soccer, right? Even the top, top level players, they're going to give the ball away. You know, they're going to get tackled. They might make it, they might make a bad decision. That's perfectly fine, right? We need to accept that. And then it's how we, we cope with that and move forward. And so a big, a big thing for us is, you know, we're not going to be, on the sideline, berating people if they've done anything, even in practice, you know, we'll we'll be vocal and help people in positioning. And, you know, sometimes if it's, a, if it's urgent, we might be even a bit more louder, but um, when, we're never going to be, you know, screaming at somebody or subbing someone off if they've had a, if they've had a real bad moment, you know, and we'll kind of talk them through it and, and, you know, use it as a learning moment to see if we can do better that, that next time through. Um, playing wise, obviously, you know, we want to play to win. And so, whatever we've scouted on our opposition each week and, you know, what we, what we deem fit and how to go into a game to, to get the best result possible, that's how we're going to set up. And so if it means that, you know, we might have more of the ball in the game, then so be it. If it means that we, we might have less of the ball in a certain game, then, then so be that. You know, I think one of the biggest things that, that we talk about as a staff is it's, it's a real pet peeve when people lose and then they, they come out and say, oh, yeah, but they didn't play the right way. Well, you know, there's, there's no nobility in losing, right? Everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to get that ring at the end of the season. And so, you know, we, we it would be perfect in a perfect world. Yeah, we would keep the ball for 85 minutes of the game and have a thousand passes and create chances after chances. But in reality, you know, it, it happens few and far between. And so 
we you know with the analytics and the video analysis and you know when we're scouting our oppositions we come up with a game plan that we believe is the best for us to get a result and that may change from from game to game sure well coach i really appreciate it you you've given us lots of information but i want to extract one last piece from you and that is if if you had one nugget one piece of advice for anybody going through the college recruiting process right now something you want to make sure any parent or player knows what would that one piece of advice be so biggest thing that I always tell recruits is, is don't shut any doors. You know, the world is full of doors and you want to get as many of them open as possible so you've got more opportunities to lead down further roads, right? And I think that for nearly everybody, there's a college out there, right? Obviously, for the sheer number of how many people play soccer and, and how many colleges there are, right? Yeah, technically there's not. But there's so many people that will shut a door because they're instantly, I don't want to leave my state or... I don't want to go to the other side of the country or I only want to play D1, right? If a coach is interested in you, listen to them, listen to what they've got to say, entertain the conversation, you know, go on a visit, go and look at the place because you may end up actually stepping foot on campus and thinking, well, I actually could see myself living here beyond college, you know? And so, yeah, my biggest bit of advice would be don't shut any doors, keep as many open as possible. Okay. Awesome. Well, coach, Really appreciate the time. Really interested to see how you guys do in the fall. And if you get to any of the recruiting events down here in Bradenton, give me a shout and we'll, uh, we'll get together, all right? Definitely. Thank you for giving me the time to come and talk to you about our program. And uh, hopefully, yeah, we can, we can touch base and, and keep in touch and meet, meet soon. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.